What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. Please be sure to hit that subscribe button right there. As you guys know, it's free. It's right there. Hit that so we can keep coming to you guys with as many interviews as possible with the icons in the game. So please subscribe, like, share, talk about our material, each one, teach one. We guys appreciate it. And today we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by Sweet T. Sweet T, thank you for coming through. Hey, how are you? Everything is good. Got to give a uh, got to give a shout out to Dana Dane for linking us up. So thank you that for that, Dana. Yes, and, Dana. Yes. So sweet tea. Uh, so many things I wanted to ask you about. Um, but one thing I always heard or didn't know or was always unsure of was, were you on the Davy DMX one for the trouble? Yes. So how how did you get involved in that song and and what was your real role in that? Well, Davy D was looking for a Davy DMX girl, and I went to his house. Um, one of my friends was actually going, and she was like, just come, just come. But I didn't know when I got there that he started describing what he was looking for, and, and my friend just came and saying, well, she could do that. I need somebody that can rhyme. She could do that. I need somebody that could dance. She could do that. So... You know, I guess he saw everybody he wanted to see. And then he called me by the time I got home and sent a car for me to come back. And then we worked and the rest was kind of like history. It was um, another girl, because it was two of us, and we were the Davy DMX girls. And her name was Iani James. And um, yeah, so that was, kind of, that was my first experience out on the road and my first record experience. So that was real early in the game, and I would imagine you were pretty young. So how mm -hmm. did how did uh, you even hear of the opportunity? I mean, because he's in the hood. He's in Hollis. We've been in Queens. You know, it's always like, you know, especially back then, like word of mouth of everything going on. And um, like I said, my homegirl was like, I'm going to Davy DMX's house, you know? And I was like, well, I'm going, you know? went there just on a whim, didn't have anything rehearsed, didn't know I was going to do anything. And, you know, she just pushed me out there. And I'm glad she did because it was a great, great experience. You know, Davey D taught me a lot. He taught me a lot. You know, I owe a lot to him. And then how did you, were your aspirations always to get in on the artistic side of things, even at that, at that time? Well, yeah, by that time, I was out in the parks. I was doing things all over Queens or wherever. I was always on a mic somewhere. So that was already, you know, that was already in play. But I didn't know that that was going to be my first, you know, little break with Davey DMX. That just came left field, you know. And um, I mean, going on the road with him was like, he showed me like, you know, how a lady is supposed to act on the road. Like, you know, he was just like, you know, he knew I was younger. So he was just like, you know what? You gotta stay in your room. I'm like, but the party and everybody's over. And he was like, you are going to your room and that's where you belong, you know? So <laughs> I used to be mad at him and hate him. Oh, you just don't want me to get a boyfriend, you know? And he was like, you are gonna stay in your room at night. That's where you're going to be. And, oh, God, I love him for that. I love him for that. And he's definitely a musical, I mean, so musically talented, can sing, can play instruments, and along with DJing. He's just an all-around great guy. Yeah, man. Have you seen Davey? <laughs> yeah, he, yes. yes. So, so given that affiliation and given that that was early on, how did you end up gravitating toward Herbie and getting, getting with him? Well, you know, we did a couple of songs um, with Davey and then Davey, you know, was on a roll doing different things. He DJed, he did a lot of different things. He would be with Run DMCs at times, just moving around. And, you know, at some point it was just like, okay, that little run with that record particularly was over, you know? So, um, we weren't like a sign like group that we were just going to stay, you know, as a group. 
So, you know, he gave me my blessings to just, you know, do things that I wanted to do. So I was actually running around doing quite a few things until I ran into Herbie Lovebug one night at a, at a, um, at Latin Quarters. And, you know, the very next day we recorded It's My Beat. Um, I went home. I was so pumped because I talked with him and he was like, yo, let's work because he knew who I was. You know, he had seen me around. He had seen me do a few things. So it was just, you know, us getting together and talking. And we went to, um, he, dro he dropped me off home and I went inside and I started writing and, you know, humming melodies and I put them all on his answering machine. And then he called me the next morning and was like, I'm coming to pick you up. And we went and we recorded, um, you know, just the demo in his house of It's My Beat. So it just, it just went on from there. And then what about, how did Jazzy Joyce get involved? Jazzy, I just, I, I mean, once It's My Beat was recorded, um, Herbie was actually dealing with Dana Dane. And I'm gonna tell you, Dana played a part in me getting my record deal because once um, I started dealing with Herbie, it was like there was a recording studio called Bayside Studios that I recorded in with Davey D. That was where Davey D recorded. And I specifically asked Herbie, I said, I like it there. Can you, can we record my music there? So Herbie took me there and let me record and, you know, got cool with David Ng, who was the um, owner. And then Herbie started gravitating the whole team to that studio. And so, um, Dana was at a different recording studio in Manhattan. I forgot which re recording studio it was, but he wanted to move Dana, but he had to get permission from Profile Records to move him and get a, a tab at a different studio. Because remember, you used to just run a tab back then and the record label paid for it. So Herbie took my recording up to Profile Records to let them hear the clarity and the sound. And, and um, they were like, good, cool, but who's that? You know, who's that on the record? And then, you know, Herbie just came home, like, with some paperwork, like, you know, yeah, Profile Records, like, offered you a record deal, you know? And so there was no process. There was no, okay, we got to shop you. It just all fell into place, you know? That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. So right off the bat, um, early in the game, Herbie was working with you and, of course, Salt and Pepper mm -hmm. around the same time. So yeah. that early on, and, of course, we had Sha Rock and we had other females that had been out and stuff, but they hadn't exploded like Salt and Pepper was about to, like you were about to and different things. So what do you think it was that made Herbie a good conduit for you in particular to, to get out there? Herbie was just, I don't know, Herbie was just, he was business minded and he was talented at the same time. He was very intuitive and like he moved, he made moves. He was in front of people. He was talking to people. He was saying, you know, um, this is what we need to do. This is the way we need to do it. You know, no disrespect to my hometown, New York. I love you. Woo, woo. But he always said, I am not making music particularly for New York. So stop with all of these, you know, you're going to be okay in the hood records. He said, it's cool to have some of that, but I'm, I want to be out there. And he might have been one of the first people back then to just think, because we, you know, we from New York, so everybody's thinking right there. He was already like way out there. Like, you know, this is where we need to be. We need to make records that are going to appeal to the rest of the country when it comes to, you know, rhyming. So he was very calculated in everything he was doing, trying to move us along. And he did it, you know, I wasn't there every minute for everything he did, but he'd always come to the table with something like, hey, we're doing this now. And we're like, okay, we're doing this, you know? So, I mean, he was, he was a great businessman. Yeah, well, I know this is going a little bit out of order with your career, but that's one of the things I and a lot of people appreciated about on the smooth tip because I'm from Maryland. So the go-go elements of that song. Um, yes. 
So for you, before you made that song, did you listen to a lot of Go-Go? And if so, what did you listen to? Or was that like really your first like, oh, you know, I'll take your man has some of that too. But what did, what was your experience with Go-Go prior to On The Smooth Tip? Well, Toy hung out in DC a lot. And, you know, I used to get um, the tapes. The PA tapes. The tapes that were made where they were just covering people's songs. Mm -hmm. You know, they would take somebody else's lyrics and just go go them and make tapes and sell them. And one day I was at a concert and a go go band was playing a song. And I said, why do I know the words of this record? Because they covered one of my records, mm. you know, in their set. And I went home to Herbie, like, Herbie, like they were singing one of my songs in a in a in a go-go set. And I was like, yo, it was, I mean, it was really hot, you know. So I mean, I knew all along that um that that the go-go was that it was there, kicking live, and I loved it, you know. So on a smooth tip was a real uh, pleasure to make. You know what I'm saying? That was a good record. Yeah, that's definitely one of my favorites on uh, It's Tea Time. But going back a little bit uh, for It's My Beat, one of the things that I liked about it was how you were talking about reciting your poetry on there. <laughs> and the thing that the thing I thought was interesting about it was, you know, in this 86 87 era, a lot of people didn't look at rap yet as poetry or as this fine art. So for you, being that that was your first song to really come out, what made you look at it that way? I always felt like writing rhymes was like writing poetry, you know? Um, so, you know, it was just a, it was just a cool line to put in the song to, you know, just express myself, you know, when I was younger, it just, that's how I expressed it, you know? Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker, he's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.